uh, spend this afternoon with us for a couple of hours um, just by getting on Zoom. We're also live streaming this and also doing uh, Vimeo and, and Facebook Live. And so we are just having women join us from all over in the United States, maybe other places as well. And um, it's, I, I hope that the title of this afternoon's presentation, Resilient Joy, has caught your attention. I mean, there's been a lot going on in the last several months, hasn't there? And um, there are certainly things that can steal our joy, but we want to, as Christian women, we want to learn to have that resilient joy all the time, no matter what happens. And so I know that I am looking forward to hearing what our presenter, um, Dr. Heather Thompson Day, has to share with us on this topic. Before I introduce her, though, I would just like to uh, share some things with you. Um, one, again, we are very happy that you have joined in with us this afternoon. And then secondly, just to kind of give you an idea of what the afternoon is going to look like here for the next two hours. And so um, our presenter will be doing a presentation and then we are going to move you into chat rooms. And so when you're in those chat rooms, we will have a facilitator in there and they will um, ask questions. We'll be just kind of a dialogue as you would do if you were at a, um, an actual women's retreat somewhere and you would sit down in a small group and everyone would have a chance to share if they wanted to or if they just wanted to listen. We want you to be comfortable. And so um, after uh, her first presentation, there will be kind of a little, a little time lapse um, and just be patient because it will put you into a chat room and there will be a facilitator there at that time. Uh, you may need to click where it says join breakout room. If, if you see a little blue box that says join, then go ahead and click that and that will put you into that box and um, into that box, into that chat room. And uh, we'll have a good time in those chat rooms with our facilitators and get to know you a little bit and you'll be able to share things about yourself as you feel comfortable. We want everyone to feel very comfortable here this afternoon. And then our speaker will be um, sharing with us again. And then once again, we will go into the chat room. Now, some of you who are joining live may be wondering, well, what happens to me during that time? Well, here's what's happening. So during the time when uh, those of us who are joining by Zoom are in chat rooms, those of you who are joining live, uh, we will have you stay on this main area here. And then our speaker will be talking with you on those same questions. And so you won't miss out on anything. So ladies, we want you to just settle in. We want you to uh, get a notepad and pen if you think you might be wanting to take notes. I know I sure am. And um, just plan to have a really good afternoon here. We'd like you to silence your phones at this time or anything else that might be distracting uh, to other people. And at this time, if you, I know many of you, as you have registered early, you may have read uh, Dr. Heather Thompson Day's bio, but for those of you who may be joining live or have not had a chance to um, understand how fortunate we are to have um, our speaker here today, I would like to share that with you at this time. And so Dr. Heather Thompson Day is an interdenominational speaker and contributor for Religious News Service, Newsweek, and the Barna Group. She is also Associate Professor of Communication at Colorado Christian University. She is passionate about supporting women and runs an online community called I'm That Wife, which has over 100,000 followers. Heather's writing has been featured on the Today Show. Are you listening, ladies? We have someone who's been on the Today Show and the National Communication Association, and she's been interviewed by BBC Radio Live, and she believes her calling is to stand in the gap for young our young people in our churches. She is the author of six books, including Confessions of a Christian Wife and How to Feed the Media Vore. She lives in Lakewood, Colorado with her husband, who is a pastor, Pastor Seth Day, and their three children, London, Hudson, and Sawyer Day. So I want you to just settle back at this time and... Um, we are going to turn this time over to Dr. Heather Thompson Day. Hello, good afternoon. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. I am just going to 
set my stopwatch here so I can tell how much time we have and share my screen for our presentation. As I was trying to think about what to present with you today, let me see, here we go. Um, our first talk today is going to center on essentially that this is, let's be honest. Do you mind? Can we have a minute to just be honest about how hard resilience actually is, right? Sometimes we get used to in our Christian circles, throwing around terms, not realizing the weight of what it actually means and presents in my life. It is one thing to be resilient because my car ran out of gas and I can't get to where I want to get on time, right? Be resilient. Okay. I can probably do that. I've done that before. It is a whole other conversation to be resilient. If I, if I think my husband is cheating on me, what does resilience look like now? What does resilience look like if my teenager tells me I want nothing to do with the church? I want nothing to do. I'm done. What does resilient joy look like now? What does resilient joy look like in a world with a pandemic and economic insecurity? What does resilient joy look like now? I had a conversation the other day at the park. I went with um, a friend from another church and I was saying to her, you know, I just, it's just so important for me that I have genuine Christian community where I can tell people, this is what I'm carrying. This is what I'm dealing with. I need someone to talk to about this yucky stuff that I would never share with anyone else. And she looked at me and this is somebody who has been raised in the church her entire life. And she said, yeah. And she looked really sad. She said, that would be nice, wouldn't it? And so I had this, this moment where I realized, you know, so many people sit in our church pews and they have all these broken pieces and we would never dare really show them to anybody. And I kind of wonder if living out our faith just looks like sitting down next to somebody and saying, hey, I can help you hold these pieces if you'd like. I can tell you resilience, I'll get into it more in our afternoon session, but resilience in community is absolutely possible. It is so hard to be resilient when we are isolated and secluded by ourselves. But when we show up for women's conferences and retreats and church community and potlucks and hop on Zoom and have calls, like resilience looks very different when I have somebody else to go through this with me. Our talk today is called, This Should Be Easier. This should be easier. I don't know where we got this idea as a church, I, and I really think this is unique to Western American Christianity. I don't know where we got the idea that if God is with us, it's going to be easy. I don't know where we got that idea because it's not in scripture. And we're going to be honest about that. So let me just say this before we get going. If you forget everything else I say today, I want you just to remember this. Okay. If things are hard right now, it doesn't mean that you've done something wrong. I think a lot of times we show up like Job's friends, right? And Job was a righteous man, scripture says. And his three friends come and they sit down and they say, well, you, you must have done something wrong. You must, have, you must have messed up the formula. And that's not the reality for Job right? And that's not always the reality for us. And so I want you to alleviate yourself of this feeling like if I was, if I just believe that if I had gone to the right school or gone to the right church or married the right guy and raised my kids in the right way, everything's supposed to be easy. I want you to let go of that. I want you to let go of this idea that we can control really much of anything that happens on this earth. 
And I'm going to show you in scripture that if you feel like, man, shouldn't this be easier? That feeling you're not alone. You are not alone. Our text today is going to come from Judges 6, 12 through 13. And it says this, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Whoo. Let's pause for a second and just take that in. The angel of the Lord appears probably in just like glory and honor and says, Gideon, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Wow. Let's check out what Gideon replies and tell me if you see yourself at all in the text. I know when I read it this last time, man, I saw it so differently because I saw myself in the text. And by the way, the story of Gideon, we're not going to go to the whole story. I'm actually just going to stay on this one verse here, 12 and 13, these two verses. But the story of Gideon is a story of resilience. But let's look what happens right here in the beginning. In, in the beginning, it says, pardon me. This is what Gideon says. Pardon me, my Lord. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? If the Lord is with me, why is my marriage like this? If the Lord is with me, why did I just lose my job? If the Lord is with me, why are my kids going through this? In other words, Gideon says, if the Lord was with us, wouldn't this be easier? This should be easier. Make sure as you hop on that you hit mute on your mics as you get on. Otherwise, we can hear you. Um, so just make sure you check that little box and make sure it is muted. Pardon me, Gideon replies, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? What does resilience look like when we just believed in our heart? I mean, have you ever been there where you say to people, no, you don't get it. God's going to do it. God's going to show up. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's going to do it. He's... And you pray the same prayer for 10 years, 15 years. Abraham, 20 years. Shouldn't this be easier? Shouldn't this be easier? By 2028, the second highest disease impacting Americans will be depression. Go evangelize, right? Go make disciples. If the Lord is with us, shouldn't Shouldn't this be easier? We are living in a world, today this is the most overweight, drug addicted, alcohol addicted, depressed, loneliest generation in US history. And we have to, I'm telling you as a church, we have got to be honest in these conversations. If we want to reach real people, we have to be real people. And we have to be willing to have the hard and uncomfortable conversations. I teach young adults, I work with college students and I hear it all the time where they just feel like there's this disconnect between what they're actually experiencing and what the church they feel prepared them for. And I think a great cure for that is to go to scripture itself and realize that this is going to be hard. We are kidding. Or let's just say this too. There's a real devil, right? Who seeks to devour and destroy. We are kidding ourselves if we think this was ever going to be easy. We are kidding ourselves. Between one in four and one in three U.S. students say they've been bullied at school. And I can just see a seventh grader laying in their bed saying, God, if you were with me, wouldn't this be easier? 
And we have to be very careful about how we talk about God's presence because else people will believe that the presence, that the blessings of God always accompany the presence of God. But I'm telling you, that is not the story that we will see in scripture. And the understanding of what it means to be resilient will look different when we realize this doesn't mean that God has left me and it doesn't mean that I have done anything wrong. This is the reality of living in a broken, sinful world. Females ages 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be victims of rape, attempted rape, or, sec or sexual assault. Shouldn't this be easier? I want you to catch this statistic because it's really important as women to know if we want to do any evangelism or reaching to anybody outside of our safe, secure circles, we have got to understand things like this. Domestic violence is the leading cause of injury to women. Catch this last part. More than car accidents, muggings, and rapes combined. Joy can look really hard depending on what you have gone through. But here's what I want to say to you, because I've had students sit in my office and they say, and by the way, I, I believe this is horrible theology. I'll have a student sit in my office and she'll say to me, you know, my, I was raped for five years. I was molested for five years by my uncle, but it's, but it's fine because that, that was God's will for me. And I tell her, sweetie, I don't know who told you that, but that was not God's will for you. We have stepped outside as a human race of God's will a long time ago when we first sinned in Eden. None of what we see right now is God's will for you. God's will is not an event that happens to us. It is how we respond to what happens. Did you hear me? Because there's a difference. God says, I, this is the beauty of being a Christian. And this is where resiliency kicks in. This is where we can say, no, 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 we have this hope. Because God says, I can take even broken pieces and make something beautiful. God made people out of nothing. He made an entire universe out of just speaking from his, the sheer vibrato of his vocal cords. You are kidding me if you think he can't take the broken pieces of your life and make something new. God says, I can take a crooked path. That makes no sense to anybody else. And I can make it straight. God won't waste anything. God's will is not an event that happens to us. It is how we respond to what happens. God's will is for us to draw close to him in the midst of our pain. That's what God's will is. God's will is for you to say, I don't get this. And God, if I'm being honest, I'm angry. This hurts. But I'm going to draw close to you anyway. This is God's will for his people and for his church. God's will is for us to use our painful life events to carry his message of hope, grace, forgiveness, and mercy. Judges 6, 12 through 13, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied. But if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? You tell me, where did we get the idea? Where did we get the idea that the presence of God is marked by the blessings of God? Where did we get this idea? And I want to tell you, God's presence is the blessing. God's presence, his presence to carry us through, though I walk 
through the valley of the shadow of death, not around. God's not always sending a helicopter to fly you over. Hey, that looks, that looks like that would have been hard. God says, no, this world is hard, but here's, here's the hope. You will never be alone because I will walk through this with you. Amen. We certainly didn't get the idea that this would be easier from scripture. If we, if you read the Bible at all, it would really strip us away of these myths that we understand or that we, we perpetuate to other Christians about what it's supposed to look like to be a Christian. Joseph is sold into slavery at 17 years old, and he's not made overseer of Egypt until he's 30. So for at least 13 years, I am sure Joseph is sitting there and saying, God, if you were with me, wouldn't this be easier? We certainly don't get this idea from Joseph. Jo Jesus says in John 16, 33, it says this, I have told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. By the way, that doesn't say that you will always be happy. The verse says in me, you can have peace. And peace often, what, surpasses understanding. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. Not you may. Jesus didn't say, in this world, if you do everything right, you can avoid trouble. No, he says, in this world, no matter what you do, you will have trouble. This is a broken, sinful world. This is not your kingdom. This is not supposed to be your kingdom. So take heart. I have overcome even this broken world. I have overcome it. And I will walk with you through it. Joseph says to his brothers in Genesis 50, 20, you intended to harm me. Here's again, where we get to see the hope of Christ. You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God can take a crooked path and make it straight. And I want to say this too. Sometimes deliverance will not, in Joseph's story, right? We get to see the deliverance part in chapter 50. We get to see Joseph become like the second highest person in the land. The reality is that sometimes that deliverance will not come for us in this kingdom, on this earth. And I think sometimes we think that like, this is the story. I'm here to tell you, this is the hope we have as Christians. And this is what we have to be sharing with other people. This isn't the story. This story is a mere blip in the story of what will actually be our lives in eternity in heaven. The story doesn't end here. And I think we think that the story ends when we die. That's not how it ends. The story continues in a resurrection. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 23 to 27, let me know if you think Paul would have thought this would be easier. Paul, one of the greatest missionaries of all time right? Jesus literally, God blinds him and he has this like experience where he hears the voice of God. You would think if anybody with an anointing and a calling over his life would just go out there and just do it for God and everything, just all the waters part, you would think it would be Paul. And it's not. Paul writes that he was shipwrecked three times stoned, was beaten within 39 lashes, lashes, one less than it took to kill a man five different times, Paul is beaten. He went without sleep, without food, without water, and was left cold and naked on more than one occasion. I am sure Paul thought at times, especially when he's in prison, like, God, shouldn't this be easier? Lord, if you are with us, then why has all this happened to us? Oswald Chambers writes this, our impatience with God's timing reveals we are more interested in God's, I want you to really listen to this. Our impatience with God's timing reveals we are more interested in God's blessings and favor than God himself. 
what if God's presence is the blessing? Jesus certainly never got the easy road. And really, we should just like pump the brakes right there. If Jesus never got to take the easy road, why in the world would we think that we would be spared? The reality is that this life is going to be hard. And in our next seminar, I'm going to give you practical ways that we can live out resilience. But first, let's just be honest <laughs> that this is hard. And not even Jesus himself, who was perfect and sinless, got a break. I want to read to you a quote from One Solitary Life by James Allen Francis. It says this, Jesus was a backwater peasant. He never wrote a book, never held an office. He never journeyed more than 200 miles from his hometown. He did none of the things that usually accompany greatness. He had no credentials other than himself. He was only 33 when the tide of public opinion turned against him. His friends ran away. One of them denied him. Actually, can I pause right here for a second? I just want to say this because we're at a women's conference. Let me just say this. At the crucifixion, at the crucifixion, all of his friends leave. You want to know who stays? Some women. And I, I won't get into, you know, all the theology, but let me just say this. God has a calling on the lives of women. God knows what women are made of. David writes in the Psalms, he says, oh, that our daughters would be pillars. What do pillars do? They hold things up. All of the men leave. And there standing at the cross is a group of women who say, I don't care what you do to me. I'm not going anywhere. There at the cross is Jesus's mother. Tell me about the love of a mother, Jesus's mother. And she says, that is my son. And I don't care if you beat me. I don't care if you put me on a cross next to him. I'm not going anywhere. You tell me if there is a group of women, if he, if God needed us at the crucifixion, you are kidding me. If you think he's not raising a generation of women for his last day church, I believe he is raising a generation of pillars who say, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not leaving him, though he slay me, yet shall I trust him. That's resilient joy. That says the most important thing in my life, I'm not afraid of those who can kill the body. I would fear that who could take my soul. I am staying at the cross, no matter what may come. Oh, that our daughters would be pillars. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of a trial. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. While he was dying, his executioners gambled his garments, the only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. 20 centuries have come and gone, and today he is the central figure of the human race. I am well within my mark when I say that all the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, and all the parliaments that ever sat, all the kings that ever reigned put together have not affected the life of man on earth as much as that one solitary life. Jesus never took the easy road. Here's what I can promise you. Here's the joy that I can absolutely promise you. Whatever God doesn't make right in this life, he will make new in the next one. Whatever God doesn't make right in this life, he will make new in the next one. Revelation 21.5 says, and he who was seated on the throne, actually pause, 
right now, God is not pacing. God is not worried. God is not throwing his hands up in the air saying, what's going to happen with this election? What's going to happen with the country? What's going to happen? God is still, I, I, somebody should put amen in the chat box. God is still seated on the throne right now, sisters. He is seated on the throne and he says, behold, I am making, it gives me goosebumps. I am making all things new. I am making all things new. This is from Ellen White. Auntie Ellen says this on page 305 of education. Fan, I mean, this, when I first read this, it blew my mind. It says this, every redeemed one will understand the ministry of angels in his own life. The angel who was his guardian from his earliest moment, the angel who watched his steps and covered his head in the day of peril, the angel who was with him in the valley of the shadow of death. She goes on to say all the perplexities that we have. This is the hope, friends. All the perplexities of life's experience will then be made plain, where to us right now have appeared only confusion and disappointment and broken purposes and thwarted plans will soon be seen a grand overruling, victorious purpose, a divine harmony. There, all who have wrought with unselfish spirit will behold the fruits of their labors. And she's talking about the resurrection. First Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18 says this, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. God says, I'm giving first dibs to my saints who you have mourned bitterly, who you have wept for. God says, I'm calling them first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. This is the story. This is the story. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Let me pause. And I, I know I'm running out of time on this one, but let me just say this. How long do you think in heaven we will be mad about what happened here? Let's say we live 80 years on this earth, 90 years. Let's say we live 90 years and it's horrible from start to finish every single second, horrible. How mad, how long will we be angry about what happened in these 90 years? Because here's the thing, here's the beauty of God. He says, I'm going to give you time. I'm going to give you time. And we're going to pour through this and we're going to talk about what you don't understand right now. You, you want, you're going to be mad in heaven. You'd be mad at me for 90 years to make the 90 years match. You were mad here a hundred years, 200 years. You need 500 years, 600 years, 700, a thousand years. How long? Because God says, when I come for you, my daughter, I'm taking you to be with me forever. That's the story. We will have an entire eternity together. Therefore, I'm going to say this another time. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Resilient joy looks like telling somebody in the throes of darkness, I get it. I get it. What has happened to you is awful. And I promise you, and let me just say this to whoever's listening, I don't know what's going on in everyone's lives and maybe everybody's lives are perfect and none of this is even relevant. But if you are anything like me, it's not been perfect. And here's what I need you to understand. God is big enough to hold your anger. He is big enough to hear your complaint. He is big enough to accept your bitterness. God walked on this earth for 33 years and they weren't fantastic years. The loneliness and isolation that he felt, the rejection and pain that he felt caused him to die of a broken heart. 
God says, I get it. And if you're mad, I get it. And I'm big enough to hold it. So I want you to give me those broken pieces and we're just going to sit, we're going to sit together in it and you can be mad and I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to listen, but I want you to know that I'm not going anywhere. And I want to do this journey with you for eternity because you are my daughter and I love you. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. But because Gideon was a human being on a fallen earth with real problems, he said, pardon me, my Lord. But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? We have this hope. We have this resilient joy that everything that doesn't get made right here will absolutely be made new. And he who is still seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new and I am preparing a place for you and you will be with me forever. That is our joy and that is our hope that this that we see right now isn't the only story. There is a better story coming. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Let me check my time. Did I make it? Okay. I went one minute over. I'm so sorry. Let me pray for you. And I think then we're going to go into our chat rooms and discuss some questions that are going to come up for our next seminar when we talk about some practical ways. I'm a communication professor, by the way. And so we're going to look at practical ways that we can wire our brain to try to live out this resilience in the midst of negative thoughts that will absolutely interrupt our thinking. Let me pray for you. Dear Heavenly Father, I am just, God, I pray for a special anointing and blessing over these pillars that you have right here on this screen. God, may you touch us. God, may we give you our anger. May we lay at the cross our brokenness and our bitterness and our disappointments. May we lay them at your feet, believing with this hope, God, that you will make all things new. May you call us to be pillars. And with supernatural strength, may we hold things up. In your name, my heavenly father, we love you. Amen. Amen. So I believe that you all should be going into groups now. Something should come up on your screen that says, would you like to enter your breakout room? And you're gonna to wanna to click to go into that. And for those who stay with me, if you are not going into a breakout room, is everybody in? Let me check here, it doesn't look like it. Donna or Joe, or can you let me know when they're put into their rooms? They are all in there. Oh, they're all in there. They're all in there and what's left is for you. Yay. Okay. So let's have some conversation. Um, if you guys wouldn't mind, if, if we could just even go around and just introduce ourselves and where we're from, is that okay? If you feel comfortable, um, if you could just unmute your mic, I'm not going to force you. I would force my students. I won't do that to you because I know some people are shy and that's okay. But if you wouldn't mind just unmuting your mic and just saying, hey, here's where I'm tuning in from and I live here, that'd be great. Okay, I will start because I want to remind everyone once you unmute and say what she wanted you to say, then please mute yourself again because if you're all unmuted, you're going to get a lot of background noise. Uh, my name is Donna Crandall and I am the secretary of Joe Dubs 
uh, who works here in the conference office. And um, Heidi and I are doing the technical background, so that's why we haven't been seen too much today. But glad to see some faces now. So I am Heidi Melton, and I work here at the conference office, and I help um, on the women's ministries team. And I am glad to be here, and I'm glad that all of you are here too. My name is Michelle Pester, and I am from Cleveland. I go to the Seventh Avenue Church up here in Cleveland, Tennessee. Great to see you, Michelle. Somebody else? I'm, I go to the Bowman Hills Church here in Cleveland. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Virtually. Nice to virtually meet you. I'm Carla Baker, and I'm uh, watching from Maryland. Hello, Carla. Great to have you. Thank you. It's good to hear you. Thanks for coming. Yeah. And to see you, too. And to see you. <laughs> Somebody else? Hello, I'm Tracy, and I'm here in the um, middle of Georgia at, from the Griffin and Thomaston Church. My husband is a pastor, Georgia Cumberland Conference. Awesome. Hey, I'm Gladys from the Chattanooga area. Nice to see. Well, I don't think I saw you, but nice to have you. Thanks for joining. Hi. I'm from Kashmir, Washington, and I'm actually standing outside the church trying to get the Wi-Fi from the inside of the church. <laughs> hey, what was your name? <laughs> yeah. Angela Ford. Angela, nice to have you. Somebody else? Somebody else feel com comfortable introducing yourself or? I am curious, Knoxville Grace is on here and I think you might have more than just one person. I think you might have a group of women. So it'd be nice to know who you are. Hi, this is Knoxville Grace. This is Donna Asbury from Knoxville Grace Day. And I do have my assistant to women's ministry leader here with me and her mom. So uh, that's why we're under Knoxville Grace rather than individual names. So, but it's, uh, it's a joy to be here and so glad that we can join you guys. We're glad too, so great to have you. So I have a question, unless there's anybody else that is willing to introduce themselves, it's always nice just to rip the bandaid off and say something before we go into the questions. Let's do this one. I, I have a few that I've written down here. And I'm hoping that somebody, I'm a teacher, so I'm used to awkward pauses and silences. It actually won't throw me off too much, but I hope that somebody will be willing to respond to this. And I'll give you just 30 seconds after I ask the question for you to think about it and really roll it over before you respond. But how about this one? Let's do this. Is there something in your life right now that you want badly? Is there something in your life right now? What's the prayer that you've been praying for a while that this piece you've been asking God to change or to make whole or to fix? What is something that you've wanted to see? Um, I can tell you for, I'll let you think about it. And I hope somebody will jump on and interact with me, but I have a, you know, I was a camp counselor at when I was like 18 years old. And I still to this day am very, very probably best friends with um, another counselor that I met at that time. And when we were 18 at camp, um, a pastor came and said, you know, you should really have a Christian accountability partner, somebody that you are totally honest with about your struggles and that you're able to just ask for prayer. And, and when you, if you, you know, make the wrong choice that you can just go to and say like, Hey, I messed up and I did this thing. Um, can, can you pray with me and, and, you know, help me make a better choice. And so I started a relationship with her and we have been praying for years now 
um, for her to have a husband, for her to find her partner. And so that is definitely something, and we, and we still haven't seen the answer to that prayer, but that is definitely something that we have spent, I mean, 10, 12 years praying on and wrestling with. And um, it's something that she wants badly. I'm just wondering, is there something, is there somebody on here that's willing to share something that you have been praying on and asking God to inter intercede with? I think it would be great if, and I talked about like authenticity. I just think it would be great if more Christians were willing to say, hey, you see this right here? This is, this is my scar from when I was wrestling with God. Here's what I've wrestled with God with. And be honest that, you know, this is a wrestle. This is a wrestle. And what do we know from the story of Jacob? When we wrestle with God, we often walk out with a limp, right? It's hard to be super cocky um, when we are living in a broken, sinful place. So if there, is there anybody willing to share something that you have, that you wanted badly, that you've prayed about for a long time? I'll hop on and be vulnerable. Thank you so much, Michelle. I love vulnerable people. Um, I know Donna and Helen know my story and I'm not gonna get into the details of it, but um, I have been separated from my husband for about since last October. And I've been praying for guidance from God as to go with, through with a divorce, not. And God is leading us down a path of no divorce and of reconciliation. So it's been a really, really tough road. Thank you so much for sharing that. Somebody else feel comfortable sharing that we are real people wrestling with things? I'd like to share. Um, Thank you. I have done some foster care and there's two little boys. Um, that from from day one they were with me you know one was a year old and the other was um newborn and they have since gone back to their family but over the years we've been able to take them to church each week and um maintain that close relationship and recently um and i've just been really really praying for their hearts that they would come to know god they're eight and nine now, um, but it's hard when they're almost like your kids, but they're not yours. Mm -hmm. And so you can't raise them like you would. <sighs> the judge just um, allowed the mother to take them to Sunday church now instead, <laughs> which is a really hard um, blow, but God, you know, they came today. And so I'm very thankful for that. And I'm still, I'm still praying for their hearts and and it may not look like what I want it to look like, um, but I have to believe that God is still working in those little children's lives. And yeah, it's rough. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Somebody else? What are we carrying? What are we wrestling Somebody else feel comfortable? I had said something on uh, Twitter recently and I took a screenshot of this girl's response because she was talking about something that she's been praying for that she wants desperately um, for many years now. And she said, you know, would I if God never opens that door for me, will God himself be enough? And I think that that's a question like that we all need to wrestle with and have answers for. And I think it's also safe to say, God, I'm not there. Like, just be honest, God, I'm not there. <laughs> and I can't even imagine my life if you never answer this particular request. Um, so help me, help me have a relationship with you where you would be enough. 
where you would be enough. How, here's another question I have. Um, how do we surrender? How do we, what does surrender look like? And how do we actually do this? Where we come to a place where we say, you know, if, you know, though he slay me yet, shall I trust him? Does somebody have an example of something that they've had to surrender in their lives that you can walk us through? You know, I'll share along with um, looking for her name, the gal that shared about, oh, Ed. It's not Brianna Ford, it's whatever your name is about foster. Um, I actually have two foster girls that I adopted and they were supposed to go back, then weren't, and then were. And through the whole process, we were told that we could get in our own attorney and fight to keep them. And it was like, Lord, you know what's best. Really, it's good for them to be with their family if they can get their stuff together. But if not, and you want us to raise them, then you work that out. And it was, I mean, it was a long process because they were foster girls for 21 months, you know, and the, and the visits and having to give their parents more rope to hang themselves on and to see the hurt that they went through and the rejection and all the stuff that they went through. But ultimately we did adopt them and they're now 15 and 14. Wow. And they were one and one and two when I got them, when we got them and stuff. And just the process of having to trust God for that, because um, I was, you know, we were not able to have our own kids. And so adoption was our, our option mm -hmm. and wanting children, but having to trust God for that. And so wow. you, you work it out and yeah. Can, and cause I'm, I'm just assuming Michelle, that there's other people on that. What you've described is a reality. Right. And so how, what does that, how do we work that out? How did, how were you able to come to a place where you say, okay, maybe what if my plan isn't going to be the plan that I actually live out? And I, how, how would you advise another woman in your exact situation, how she gets there, or what it looked like for you? I don't know. I mean, my mind was positive. You mm -hmm. know, there was always the fear of, um, you know, is there another relative that will pop up that would take them? Is there another person that they would feel would be a better placement for them long term? Is there a better, you know, situation or whatever? And, um, you know, there it actually we were told that they were going to go home. And then we actually adopted a little boy from India. And oh, then wow. like a month later, a couple months later, they said, um, oh, no, they're not going home. They were given it was the parents were given the, the ultimatum of either your rights will be terminated or you can give them up for adoption. Those are your two choices. Which would you like to do? And so they said, well, if, if, if there's nobody else, then if the um, foster family would adopt them, that's what they wanted for their girls. They were given that input, or at least they could voice their opinion. Oh, wow. um, but it was, it was probably a six to nine month time period from when all of that happened. So just trusting in God and each, each, I mean, I shed many tears over, mm -hmm. you know, God, I love them. I've, I've been their mom. I've, you know, helped them because they were behind, they were delayed. They were in speech therapy and occupational therapy, you know, just lots of stuff that they were going through and it was hard and having to, I guess, do my best to take care of them and, um, trust God in, in, in claim scripture and, mm -hmm. And say, okay, God, and and then let God, not me try to rush out and hire my yes. agent to keep them. Okay, God, if you want them to go somewhere else, then I have to let them go. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, I was glad I didn't have to, but having to trust God and and not take it into my own hands was hard. Yeah, and thank you so much. And I, I just want to say that these these stories are powerful for other people to hear. Um, and so I hope that we will be able to learn to share them. Does anybody else wanna share 
something that, what did, what was the last time? When was the last time that you had to surrender something? And what was that process like? How would you advise somebody else who is like, man, I don't know how to do this. This is painful. Heather, Heather yeah. I'm living, I'm living in the situation that you're describing now. I retired February 1 of this year and I'd been planning it for a couple of years and I started, I had my realtor lined up. I had packed uh, quite a bit of my house was in storage because when I went, you know, on February 1, I was going to finish getting my house ready. I was going to have it in the market by March 1. I was going to be out of here by <laughs> May. You know, that was my plan. I had worked. I'm a planner. Right? Yep. And, and I had been working my plan. But two weeks before I retired, I fractured my kneecap. And, and you can't do anything with a fractured kneecap. Except oh, my goodness. Stay off of it, you know. And it, the healing process took me into late April. And by then... COVID-19 had hit and it really wasn't safe for me. I'm in the vulnerable age. Mm -hmm. It wasn't safe for me to be out there doing, you know, with the moving process. And, and I hadn't found a place, uh, a house to move to anyway that I could afford. And so I'm just, I, at first I just panicked. I mean, my life was totally out of control. And, um, and I, I, a friend of mine, I, I called her, she's a prayer warrior. And I asked her to just please pray for me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was in such a funk. I have never been that low. Um, and so she did. And praying friends are the most wonderful thing. Yes. <laughs> and so honestly, from that moment, from the moment she said, amen, I had peace and so I'm still, I'm waiting for God to show me when it's good, safe here to move and when it's safe to move. And I'm moving to Texas, which was one of the worst places. Oh my goodness. Virus right now. And so it's not a good time for me to go there and there's still no house available that I can afford. So I'm just waiting and I'm just saying, Lord, just show me the way, but at least for now, he's, he's given me peace. Mm -hmm. And the key to it was the prayer of a believing, praying sister. And Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. I, I recently just had a conversation with a friend and she was saying, you know, I'm praying this to God and I'm not hearing anything. And I, I've at least learned for myself that you just go in the direction of peace. God is in the direction of peace, right? So if you, when you think about moving at this moment, there's no peace, you don't do it. And he will Man. give you peace. Yeah. And that's, that's what I've learned. Sometimes he doesn't part the clouds and, and shout, this is what you're supposed to do. And so we have to be very still and quiet and listen and pay attention to where our hearts feel peace. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing that. Somebody else care to share? Anybody else care to share? The last time that you've had to surrender? Okay. Um, my next question to discuss is going into kind of our um, next session. So just start thinking about this, but can you, do you have community? That's the question. Do you have Christian community that you, you know, can, can show up to? Do you have community? Anybody feel, feel free to jump in. Oh, 
say I feel that I have community. Um, I work here at the Georgia Cumberland Conference and I have wonderful, wonderful coworkers. Um, it was kind of hard when we were um, in quarantine and working from home. It was, it was more difficult. Um, everybody trying to learn how to use ne ne new technology and right. Zoom. But I tell you, such a blessing for me being back at work with my coworkers. And some of them are on here. And also um, our women's ministries team. And we really want to create community um, you know, we've been working on that for the women in our conference, and it's been a challenge because we're having to do it differently. But I'm glad that there are women on here today from different conferences, too. Yeah, I believe that it it will help us build more. Thank you. Anyone else? Do you have community? What does that community look like? How have they benefited your life? Someone care to jump on? Well, I guess for me, it's um, the women's ministry officers or my community, just coming up with ways of how we can minister to the ladies in our church has been a struggle. And I guess, you know, you asked the question before, how do we surrender? And I, I had to kind of this week battle that question of, am I going to do two more years of women's ministries or am I going to just say no? And Michelle knows about this, my struggle, you know, with this. And, and I, in fact, when a nominating committee called on Monday and says, hey, Helen, we want you to serve again. I told them, I'm sorry, but it's no. And they says, we're going to give you a week. <laughs> <laughs> and I spent the entire week just vomiting. I mean, literally vomiting and not sleeping. And, and just to the point that I didn't want to continue. And I do surrender. You know, the definition of surrender is to cease <laughs> resisting. You know, and I was like, no, no. And a friend of mine finally said, came and called me. She's the director of women's ministries for the Kentucky Tennessee conference. And she says, Helen, I'm going to pose this question on, you know, for you. Do you have no more to give God? Not if I had more to give the women, you know, or myself, if I had more, because that, that would be, no, I don't have any more, you know, but she had, do you have no more to give God? Because I was forgetting that this ministry is God's not, you know, oh, people are not showing up, you know, to the zoom meetings or people not coming to the devotionals or people not, you know, it wasn't about that. It's about God. And after the sleepless week, you know, I finally called up, you know, the person that called me, which just happened to be my mother-in-law, because she's in, in the nominating committee. And I said, Susie. And she says, oh, give me the good news. And I was like, well, let me give you the bad news first. She's like, no, you know, but, you know, of course I accepted it. I'm going to do it. But it's been so hard to find a community when, you know, everything is going on right now. Yeah. And, you know, and you have that struggle that once, you know, before you had a great time with people and now you're distant and you have to find a new way to um, socialize with others. But one of my new communities is this women's ministries hat from the conference has been very active putting activities up that people can go to. And I have been greatly blessed by this community from the conference that has done teas and crafts and you know and even today's session that kind of lifts you up and says you know what i need to surrender everything yeah i need to put it in god's hands and you know so i'm just thankful for this new community that has sprung up even out of this pandemic that's awesome thank you so much for sharing that and i'm sure so many of us can relate to that feeling of we didn't even talk about that but when we have to surrender into what God is calling us into that we're just like, Lord, please, you know, anywhere, but here, um, but we have to surrender. Okay. My next question. And I think, are we doing this, Donna, is this till two, or, I'm sorry, it's for your guys' time, 410? Yes. That's okay. It. So we have six minutes. So I'm hoping you guys will respond. And this is your chance to kind of brag on somebody who's been so good to you. Have you ever had a female mentor 
that wasn't your mother or grandparent? If so, how did that person impact your life? So I hope we have some people that are willing to talk about somebody else that has deeply impacted them. Have you ever had a female mentor that wasn't your mother or grandparent? And if so, how did that person impact your life? Um, I'll go Yay, ahead. Thank you. My um, mentor was Gail McKenzie from the Kentucky Tense Conference. Um, I lost four children and, you know, I was very hard for me. I was so depressed. I didn't get out of bed for four years. You know, I had hyperemesis. So that means that I had to be fed by a tube in order for the child to survive. So all my five pregnancies were that same way. I have one daughter that lived, my first daughter. And then one after the other, the twins died next. And then our, we buried our son, Jonathan. And the last one, it was an abortion that they had to take me to Atlanta to get aborted because I was dying and my heart was failing. And they said, you have to do it, but they don't do the procedure in Tennessee. You have to go to Atlanta, you know? So we went down and it was closed. So I had to come back with a bucket and just vomiting bile because I couldn't eat. It was just whatever the, but the smell of the food as I was driving was killing me. So we finally got the abortion. And then a few weeks later, the Kentucky 10 conference calls to see if I would come up and do help them do Hispanic camp meeting. I didn't want to. Wow. And to make it short, you know, I finally, you know, after a lot of struggles, I finally said yes. And I went down there and I met this godly, godly woman. And just sitting with her and her meetings and having her start every meeting, looking at the word of God, just finally just broke me down that after the meeting, you know, I just cried. I couldn't drive home. They had to put me up in the hotel because I was so moved by that committee and by this wo woman that God had just thrown at me, you know, literally just basically threw me her at me. And we have been friends ever since. And, wow. you know, sometimes you have somebody that's unexpected that lifts you up when you are in your mind, you know, in my mind, I had given up everything to the point, and I don't mind sharing this with this. Hopefully this will not go anywhere else. Oh, wait, no, this is live. Oh, well, that's fine. But okay. I mean, <laughs> this, this is streaming. Spread the word, but, you know, to the point that you're in such a despair that you want to do nothing. You know, I was giving up everything to the point that I had gone, you know, down to almost 68 pounds. Wow. Because I did not want to live. I just had lost so much children that I just couldn't, you know, just burying one after the other, after the other, just was too much for me, too much for me to handle. And, you know, but God is great. You know, he sends you exactly the person that you're needing at the right time. And for me, it was Gail. And I just praise the Lord every day for this woman who has just made me see God in a different way. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that, Helen. That is, that's what I'm saying. We're all dealing with, you never know where somebody is in their journey. And so how do we make space for people, right? To just, br to bring their grief. How do we make space for that as a church? And I think that that's something we, we could all do better. Um, somebody else want to share? I, we only have two minutes, but somebody you want to share quickly, somebody that was a mentor to you, not a mother or grandparent, but somebody that stepped into that role in your life, another, a godly woman who showed up. Nobody else? Well, when we do our next um, session, I'll take a second and uh, probably talk about how we go about finding mentors because I'm very passionate about having mentors. I think it's super important for our own growth and development. Um, so we can take a second when we get back again and talk about that process and what it should look like in the communication standpoint. But thank you guys so much for a great discussion and for not leaving me hanging too long. I really appreciate you guys. And thank you so much to everybody who shared. 
And I'm sure there's people who, you know, will never say anything out loud, but your words have really impacted them and your story and your testimony um, spoke right to the very situation that they're in. So thank you guys so much. Okay, Heather, it is 410, which is the next section. So if you're ready to start, I think everybody's ready to listen. Okay, is everybody back in? It kind of looks like. Okay. I just wanna reset my stopwatch. Give me one second. I talked up until that last minute, I should have <laughs> taken the second. Oh wait, no, that's not what I want to do. Two, this. All right, let me share my screen. All right. All right, so our second session here is called God Can Do a Lot with Empty. And this particular seminar is one I do all the time. Um, I do it for corporate places and also for churches, um, going through negative thoughts and um, how we can learn and train our brains to disrupt negative thoughts. Let me skip that video. Oh, actually, I'm in the wrong one. Hold on one second. I opened the wrong seminar. I think I clicked that one. It's supposed to be this one. All right, here we go. All right, so the first thing that I want us to do is take a second, actually, we're gonna take two minutes and write down one family goal. So think about what is a goal that you would like to set for yourself, for your family. Maybe that's reaching out to a sister, a brother, a child, husband, a goal for your kids, goal for you to be more connected to your mom or your grandma. Think about one family goal and I want you to actually write it down. That part is really important. Just so you know, a goal is the object of a person's effort. The definition of a goal is the object of a person's effort. So writing them down is actually the first step towards our brain working towards a particular goal. So write down one family goal. When I first um, got into goals, and just so you know how the brain works is once we write down a goal, um, your brain will all of a sudden start noticing things that will help you achieve that goal. So let's say that um, you wanted to um, buy a certain type of car. If you write that down, once you set the goal, your brain will start, you won't even be able to control it. And I know all of you will have examples in your brain right now of times that you're like, all of a sudden you start noticing every time you see the car that you want to get. And you go to pass that car 50 times before, but once you've written it down, your brain's like, oh, there it is. I wonder how much it is. And you, and you start just constantly collecting data on it. When I first um, wanted to come up with some goals for myself, I wanted to uh, write down a family goal. And so my goal was to just make sure that I was being really intentional as a mom. I have three little kids and I tend to be really intentional about um, my career and my job and writing. And I was like, you know, I wanna be more intentional with my kids and, and with little kids, mine are uh, eight and under. Um, it's so easy to, to make them feel special. So I just started saying, you know what, once a month, I'm gonna make sure that I've done something intentionally for them. So we started doing like a family movie night where we make nachos or popcorn and sit down and we watch, um, a movie that they'd be interested in together as a family. And it just is a way for me to create memories for them. And it's things that if I didn't write it down, to be honest, I might stop thinking about, right? Because life is always going to bring in all these different distractions. So that's why goal writing is really important. And I, I'm, I'm forgetting the statistics, but it's like, you are like 
40% more likely to reach a goal if you simply write it down. So I hope that all of you took a second. If you don't have pen and paper by you, then just put it into your phone, write it down. Writing down your goals are really important. So family, it's hard, but it's worth it. Our close relationships to others are one of the biggest influences on our lives. Our close relationships to others are one of the biggest influences on our lives. A team of researchers wanted to study this, so they bought, brought 42 married couples into a hospital and created several small wounds on their arms. They then placed devices over the wounds to measure the rate of healing. The results revealed that it took almost twice as long for the wounds to heal for couples who reported having hostility in their relationship. So let's just pause for a second. I want everybody to understand this. When our relationships don't just affect us mentally, they affect us physically. We are really good at being intentional about jobs and cars and money and all that stuff. And for whatever reason, we often are not intentional about our relationships. And we have to stop doing that. Because if we're talking about joy, our relationships are what will produce joy in our lives. Gallup found in their 50 year long study of well being that the single biggest predictor of what leads to higher well being, I want you to hear this, is not what you are doing, but who you are with. The single biggest predictor of what leads to higher well being is not what you are doing, it's who you are with. Our relationships matter. In a 20 year Harvard study, it was found that your physical health is more determined by relationships. You guys listen to this. Your physical health is more determined by relationships than the food you eat, the exercise program you are on and the genes you have inherited. The greatest depictor of your physical health is actually your relationships with other people. This is not something that we have the liberty to be casual about. This matters. We have got to earlier, if you guys have already talked about this in your groups, when I asked, do you have community? You guys, like we have to have community. And I no longer think that God is like, you know, we're, we have to go to church because we're supposed to be more holy. I have young people all the time um, that will tell me, you know, I can listen to like the, one of the greatest orators in America. I can listen to one of the best pastors in this country at home in my underwear on my couch. I don't need to go to church for that. And I tell them, but you want to know what there's no app for relationships. God has wired us and created us to exist in relationships with other people. And actually, let's take it a step further. God himself only exists in relationship, the Trinity. If God himself only exists in relationships with others, why would we think that we can get through a hard life without other people? We need each other. And the church should be a really relevant, available community where we can find other people. By the way, 62.5% of people who reported being lonely were married and living with their partner. I say to um, you know, my single friends all the time, listen, marriage will not protect you from loneliness. The reality is that our marriages won't protect us from loneliness. We have to be intentional about our relationships. What happens when we have relationships with people is actually once we get to know someone, we feel like we have a better idea of who we are and we stop seeking information about them. So I'm going to give you just a little, some information quickly here about relationship or romantic communication. Our intimacy is based off of information seeking. Intimacy is based off of information seeking. So what that means is asking somebody, what are your dreams? What are your fears? What are your beliefs? A lot of times people think if you say the word intimacy that you're talking about sex. Intimacy is not sex. 
Intimacy is self-disclosure. And at some point in marriages, people stop talking about fears and dreams and they start only talking about kids and groceries. Information seeking is a behavior that is directly tied to emotional intimacy. Marriage won't protect you from being lonely if you don't keep learning about one another together. So I want you to write this down. Um, for those of you who, if you're about to go on a date maybe, or if you're um, in a relationship, it's Dr. Aaron Arthur, write down the, the first line that you see there, Dr. Aaron Arthur, 36 questions to fall in love. It's called 36 questions to fall in love. And um, Dr. Aaron Arthur was a, is a psychologist and he developed 36 questions that are supposed to lead you gradually into emotional intimacy. And so he did a study where he brought two total strangers into a lab and he wanted to see if um, they went through these 36 questions, if they would fall in love. And lo and behold, these two strangers, they went through these 36 questions. It'll take about two hours if you decide to do it. You can find it on Google, 36 Questions to Fall in Love by Dr. Aaron Arthur. And these two strangers ended up getting married and they brought the um, laboratory and the science department to their wedding. But I have done this with my husband. We did it for my 30th birthday um, for a date night. It is fantastic. It was the best date we ever had. When I have um, people talk to me, I do a lot of marriage seminars and stuff. When people talk to me and say, you know, we are just on totally different planes. We are not connecting. I actually can't even stand him. I say, go through Dr. Aaron Arthur's 36 questions to fall in love. It will take you about two hours and you will not regret it. Because often what happens is we stop seeking information about each other. And we forget how important relationships actually are to how we see joy, how we see resilience, how we see how well our lives are doing. Yeah, let me let me pause on that. So work goal, I want you to now write down, take, take a minute, take two minutes and write down a goal that you have for your work. What would be a goal that you have for work? When I um, first did a work goal for myself, I had just finished my PhD two years ago. And I was like, okay, I've, I've done, that was my goal for the longest time. And so once I finished that, I thought, okay, well, what, what do I look forward to now? I'm a really goal oriented person. What do I look to now? And so I wanted to figure out how I said, okay, let me try to use my PhD and, and start writing some academic articles. Uh, up until that point, I had written, you know, books and I had um, done blogging, but not academic writing. And so I started querying like Huffington Post or Psychology Today and asking if I could write some articles for them. Nobody wrote me back, but I had this goal. And so I just ended up being like, okay, God, you haven't opened any doors for that. Maybe I was wrong. But what happened was because I wrote down the goal, I started to pay attention when opportunities presented themselves. And one day I put something out on Twitter. I think I just cited a study on Twitter that I had read. And um, somebody said to me, hey, where did you get this data from? And I said, oh, I'm not sure. I think it was from the Barna Group because I read a lot of articles from the Barna Group. If you're not familiar with the Barna Group, they are the largest evangelical research institution in the country, in the world, actually. And so I said, I, th I think it's from the Barna Group. Well, the president of the Barna Group, David Kinneman, commented on my Twitter. I don't know how he saw it. And he said, Heather, this actually isn't one of our studies, but when you find out where it's from, would you let me know? And I was freaking out because I have been reading Barna data since I'm a nerd. So since I was like 15 years old, I was reading all this data about what's happening in our church and because um, they studied like Christianity and how it impacts churches. And so I looked at his Twitter feed and the last post that he had made said, that Barna was looking for data storytellers. And so I ended up writing him and saying, hey, I see that you're looking for data storytellers. And he was like, yeah, sending your resume. And so then I started writing for them. Um, but I would have never started writing for the Barna Group had I not written down this one goal because my brain wouldn't have even recognized it. I would have seen that post on his Twitter and not even realized that that had anything to do with me. So think about a work goal and write it down. Okay, we're gonna do an experiment now, right? We're gonna do a science experiment, if you don't mind. I want you to stretch your arms above your head. I want you to roll your neck. 
then roll it the other way. Okay. I want you to take three deep breaths. One more. What's happening right now when we do that is we are reducing physical, neuronal, and emotional stress in our brain. And when you're ready, we're going to do an experiment. You ready? What happened when you just saw these two letters, N O, is that immediately your brain, if you were hooked up to an fMRI scan, would have, we would have seen in less than a second, your amygdala release dozens of stress producing hormones and neurotransmitters, dozens in less than a second, you're just reading two letters, no. Immediately, physiologically, you experience a reaction. And these chemicals immediately interrupt the normal functioning of your brain, especially the areas involved in logic, reason, language processing, and communication. Two letters, no. And so I like to say to people when I do this seminar, if two letters immediately release dozens of stress producing hormones and neurotransmitters, what do you think happens when you? go on and on about how horrible you are to yourself or how unattractive you are to yourself or how this marriage is never going to work to yourself or I'm a horrible mom or I'm never going to meet anybody. What do you think is happening in your brain when you do that? If two letters impact your ability to think and use logic and reason and even what type of language you produce in the communication, if two letters can do that, what do you think happens when we go on and on and on about how much we hate our jobs or our churches or our husbands, right? And what happens, that's what happens when I, when I just see that for myself. What happens now if I start screaming at my kids? No, how dare you? What are you thinking? What am I doing to their brains? This is not like how, what you say matters. If we want to be resilient and we want to have joy, let me just fundamentally start here. What you say matters. Your words change your reality. When God created our world, how did he do it? He spoke it into existence. We are created in the image of God and your words may not be able to create a literal planet, but they absolutely have the power to affect you physio physiologically. They absolutely have the power to shut down your brain. And so I implore you to think before you speak. And I want to challenge you to learn how to interrupt negative thoughts. These are the things that impede our ability to stay joyful. The more we focus on negative words and thoughts, the more you can actually damage key structures that regulate your memory, feelings, and emotions. You can, the more negative thoughts you allow yourself to just sit in and spew with no interruption to that, you damage your brain's ability to even have memories and to do appropriate emotional conversation. Our words change our bodies and our bodies can change our minds. Spending energy thinking on negative thoughts can disrupt your sleep your appetite and the way your brain regulates happiness. So this is how powerful a single negative word, that's just an O you guys. And when we vocalize these negative thoughts, even more stress hormones are released and you experience increased anxiety and increased irritability. Negative thinking is self-perpetuating. The more you expose your brain to it, the more it will automatically generate additional negative feelings. And I know we've all been there, right? First, you're just sitting there and you're thinking, man, I don't know how I'm going to pay the mortgage this month. 
And then your brain starts spiraling and giving you all of these other horrible scenarios that could probably, I'm going to end up homeless and I'm not going to be able to keep my job. And now with COVID, what if they fire me and I don't even have a job and our brains just explode with negativity. And what I want you to understand really quickly about the brain too, is this, you are not wired to think positively. You're not what, like you have to train yourself to think positively. It's not going to come natural to you because your brain is tr trying to keep you alive. So it's going to notice everything that is wrong, right? So everybody knows if you get a, a list back from your boss and it has like this list of all the things that they like about you on your evaluation, and then they have like this one thing where it's an area of improvement. You just focus on that one area of improvement and you ignore all the other 99 awesome things that they said about you. Why do we do this? We do this because our brains are primed to notice what goes wrong. We have to tell ourselves to stop and notice what is right. So that is why we say we have to train ourselves to disrupt negative thoughts. So I would never suggest, and I don't think it's healthy, when we just pretend that whatever bad thing is happening isn't happening, right? So I would never tell people to just, to just put a smile over it and pretend like it's fine. It's totally fine. And inside you just feel like you're dying. No, what we talk about in communication is that we have to acknowledge our negative thoughts and then we reframe them as we have them. So if a stress in your life is money, you acknowledge that and you say, man, I am really stressed out about my bills this month. And so what you do is you interrupt the negative thought and you say, okay, so here's a solution. Let me spend less money on groceries this week and see where I'm at, or let me spend less money eating out this week and see where I'm at, or I'm going to pick up another shift. My sister's a nurse, so she's able to do that. I'm going to pick up another shift at work this month. I'm going to do it twice this month. And that's how I'm going to make extra money. So what you have to train yourself to do when you feel these negative thoughts creeping up on you is how do I interrupt them and offer my brain some type of solution. And the more you do this, the more it'll be the natural path that your brain takes, the faster we can interrupt our brain's reaction to real or imaginary threats, the quicker we can generate feelings of safety and well being and train our brains that this is how we deal with negative thoughts. We deal with them by offering our brains solutions or giving ourselves something that we can be grounded with. Our close relationships to others are one of the biggest influences in our lives. In a Gallup study, it was found that only 30% of employees report having a best friend at work, but that those who do, get this, are seven times more likely to be engaged with their job. And so I like to talk about this when I do pastor's trainings, because we, you know, we're losing so many people in the church and I'm telling them, but you guys, when we give people community, they will be seven times more likely to be engaged with their church. We have got to figure out how as a church we can meet real people and create real community and what an awesome testimony that Helen gave to the Georgia Cumberland Conference saying how grateful she is for these seminars that you guys have been producing like this matters. This is how we reach the next generation is by walking and journeying with them people who have you guys listen to this if you have a best friend at work you submit higher quality work. You have a higher well being and are even less likely to get injured. In contrast, those without tight workplace relationships have a dismal one in 12 chance of feeling engaged at their job. When I feel safe where I work, I am more likely to be productive. I am not worrying about who is trying to take my credit, who is trying to steal my job, or who is out to get me. I feel a sense of community and vigor for all the energy that I would have spent worrying about social threats, I am able to use to be a positive, productive employee. And let's just use this. When I feel safe at my church, when I feel safe at my church, I am more likely to be productive. I'm not worrying about who is trying to take credit for what I've done, who's trying to hurt me, who's talking about me, who's out to get me. I feel a sense of community for my church and therefore all the energy that I would have spent worrying about social threats, I am now able to use to be a productive member of my church and start my own small group because now I have energy. This is super important. It always comes down to community. So stop whispering about Betty in the break room. 
A, she hears you. B, you are creating a toxic work environment or church environment for everybody involved because it doesn't just stay in our brains. When we vocalize negative thoughts, we produce stress, not just in your own brain, but also in the people who are listening to you. You both experience increased anxiety and irritability by spiraling down negative thoughts, talking badly about people or environments generates mutual distrust. It undermines your brain's ability to build empathy and cooperation. And here's what I want you to understand, okay? This is super important. Your brain cannot distinguish the difference between fantasy and reality when perceiving negative events. It always assumes that real danger is near. Your brain cannot distinguish the difference between fact or fantasy. It always assumes, assumes that real danger is near. So what that means is once you say it, it's as real as the ground you're standing on. Once you say it, you literally speak your own reality and your brain reacts based on the words that you have used. So we have to train ourselves to be very cautious with the words we use. The human brain needs a tremendous amount of energy to function and it takes even more energy to build new neural circuits to change the way we normally communicate. In fact, every change we make in our lifestyle choices is perceived as a stressful event. So this is why when we decide, you know what, I'm gonna start going to the gym. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm going to start going to the gym. That's my goal. Our brains don't like change. So you have to say out loud, I'm not going to want to do this, but I am going to get up every single morning at this time so that I can go on a morning walk, right? Your brain, you have to realize your brain is never going to want to make these changes. All right. I want you to write down, I'm going to go a little bit over. I hope that's okay on this one. I want you guys to write down a spiritual goal. So write down a spiritual goal for yourselves. What is a spiritual goal? For me, when I first did this, I wanted to, um, well, actually this is like 10 years ago. I, I wanted to start reading the Bible cover to cover every single year. And I am 10 years in, I'm uh, in Ezekiel right now. Um, but I read the Bible cover to cover every single year and it absolutely has changed my life. Write down a spiritual goal. What is something you would like to do better in your relationship? Oh, let me skip that one. In your relationship with God. Life will never give you time to spend with God. There is always going to be something that takes your energy or appears more urgent or important than your morning devotional. And I can tell you for myself, I set my alarm. I have, you know, I have three kids. I have a husband. I have a job. I write, I have a lot of stuff. And so for me, I have to get up at 5 a.m. I get up at 5 a.m. every morning and spend time. I try to spend, I read five chapters a day. If you read five chapters a day, you will read through the Bible in about nine months. And it takes me about 30 minutes. And that one change that I made, getting up at 5 a.m. and reading five chapters a day, you guys, it changed my life. And it wasn't dramatic. It wasn't something that happened immediate or instantaneously. But as I look back at who I am 10 years later to who I was 10 years before, there's no comparison. And it's because I started prioritizing my time and my relationship with God. And I started believing, you know what? If I go to work without first spending time with God, I am cheating my students. If I start parenting my kids right now without spending time with God first, I am cheating my children. And that's how I tend to view life now. At least 134 countries have laws setting the maximum length of a work week. The U.S. does not. So I recognize that all of us are empty. We are overworked and underpaid and people are you know, struggling. And now we add a pandemic. In the U.S., 85.8% of males and 66.5% of females work more than 40 hours a week. According to the International Labor Organization, Americans work 137 more hours per year than Japanese workers, 260 more hours per year than British workers, and 499 more hours per year than French workers. The U.S. remains the only industrialized country in the world that has no legally mandated annual leave. 
In every other industrialized country except Canada and Japan, workers are mandated at least 20 paid vacation days. In France and Finland, they get 30 days, an entire month off, paid every single year. And of course, what do you think they find? People who take these paid breaks actually perform better when they go back to work, right? And so most of us in this country are just exhausted. We are tired and we're exhausted. And so of course we have all these negative thoughts and it is so hard to claim joy when I'm tired. I think tired is one of the worst things that you can be. And it's just hard at this time in earth's history to not just feel exhausted by everything around you. Second Kings 4, 2, it says this, the wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha and said, your servant, my husband is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my two boys as his slaves. Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? And then he says, tell me, what do you have in your house? And the woman replies, your servant has nothing at all. Here's what happens when we're exhausted and we're bitter and we're overworked and we feel like, Lord, this should be easier. People will say to us, so what do you still have in your house? And you'll say your servant has nothing at all. We will forget the things that are still in our house when we are exhausted. If you know the story, if you know the story, Elisha tells her, go around and bring me all your empty jars. And she gathers all of her empty jars and they overflow with oil. The symbolism of oil in scripture is the Holy Spirit. So what we can learn from this is God says, hey, with me, you can show up empty. You can show up tired and you can show up bitter and you can show up broke and you can show up angry. I just need you to show up. If you show up, if you stay in this relationship with me, I can fill you. I can fill you. Go around and bring me empty jars. And you know the story. Her jars overflow. And then what happens is she collects the jars right from the neighbors. And those jars overflow. God says with me, I just need you to show up with God. Listen, this relationship, God says, was never about what you would give me. It has always been about what I can give you. So you can show up tired and you can show up angry and you can show up broken and you can show up bitter. I just need you to show up. God can do a lot with empty. God can do a lot with empty. We just have to commit to showing up. And I want to say this in closing, right? What did I say to you earlier? Our brains cannot distinguish the difference between fact and fantasy. There are over 3,500 promises in the Bible. There are over 3,500 promises in the Bible that are available to you. What if studying scripture isn't about you becoming holy? What if it's about God telling you, listen, I need you to train your brain to respond to the attacks of the devil with the promises of God. But our brains can't recall what we haven't read. God says there are over 3,500 promises that are available to you in scripture, but your brain won't be able to recall and interrupt those negative thoughts if you've not read it. 
and our brains can't distinguish the difference between fact and fantasy. So when we say out loud, Isaiah 41, 1, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Our brains immediately are able to respond to all the negative things with the promises of God. And it becomes as real as the ground we are standing on. Amen. Amen. Let's see another one. Isaiah 40 verse two. I want you to train yourself, you guys, to start doing this. When you hear these negative thoughts, you say this out loud. You say, no devil. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. I can show up broke and I can show up angry and I can show up bitter and I can show up empty. I just have to show up. We just have to show up. Isaiah 54, one, no weapon formed against you shall prevail and you will, wait, does it say that the weapons won't form? It never said the weapons won't form. It says no weapon formed against you will prevail and you will refute every tongue that accuses you. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord and this is their vindication from me, declares the Lord. The Lord himself, Deuteronomy 31, 8, you should memorize this one. The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Once I say it, it's as real in my brain as the ground I am standing on. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future resilient joy is possible if we cling to the promises of God. Amen. You can show up tired, friends. You can show up angry. You can show up bitter and broke. God says this relationship was never about what you were going to give me. It has always been about what I will give you. God says, I require mercy, not sacrifice. We can give God our empty and he will and i'm telling you this is a message we need in these last days he will fill all of our empty jars with oil which is the symbolism of the holy spirit he is waiting on a church filled with the holy spirit that will go out and make an impact in this broken, chaotic world. May he find us, not just with our empty jars, but may we go around like the woman and collect the jars of our neighbors. Amen. Amen. There are over 3,500 promises available to us in scripture. I love that. All right. I think we are going to go into our chats again. I think we're going to go into our chat rooms again and there's some discussion questions for us there. Let me pull up mine. Okay, give me one second. I'm just trying to remember how long I have you. Oh, here it is. Okay. So I have you guys until five, five o'clock your time. Okay. All right. So let me pull up my questions and hopefully somebody's willing to talk to me. All right. Well, let me, before I, I jump into that, because I think we only had one person shared, does anyone else feel comfortable sharing about a mentor that you've had and what that relationship was like? 
Anybody feel comfortable talking about a mentor that you've had? Something my, oh, go, did you, were you gonna go down there or no? Oh, okay, okay. Um, if you feel comfortable telling me about a mentor that you've had, I'd love to hear it. Let me say this, I'm a communication professor. So these are like questions that young people will ask me all the time, which is how do I get a mentor? And my advice is to treat a mentor relationship is like any other relationship. Um, so I would not advise going up to somebody and saying, will you be my mentor? That's like going up to somebody and saying, will you marry me the first time you meet them, right? That can put a lot of pressure on that person. And honestly, maybe they wouldn't even be a great mentor for you. And you don't even realize that. So what I recommend to people is if you see somebody that is just in, in some area of life is somewhere that you really respect, or you would really want to be, whether that's spiritual or family life or work life is just say to that person, Hey, can I, can I meet with you for lunch for 30 minutes? Can I buy your lunch? And I'm going to ask you these five questions. Most people will not say no to that, right? If you are really specific about what you are looking for in that first meeting, even busy people will be more likely to say yes to something like that. I just asked um, Beth Moore, um, she's a friend of mine that I have on Twitter, and I just asked her to if she would zoom in and do a guest lecture for my class. And she said yes right? Because I was really specific. I said, Hey, Beth, my students, I was like, you remember being a young college girl, my students would love to hear from you because so many of them respect you so much. Would you give us 30 minutes um, to tell us everything that you wish somebody had said to you when you were a college student? And she said, Yeah, I'd love to do that. And so she's gonna be speaking to my students on November 10. Go up to people and be very specific about what you're looking for. Um, all right, here's the next question. If nobody wanted to talk about a mentor, I'll give that actually one more second. Does anybody want to share about a mentor that they've had or questions about a mentor relationship? Anybody have questions actually before I just bulldoze forward about anything that we've talked about today? I have a question. Yeah. Um, are we going to be able to have some of your slides and stuff or? That is a great question. And I can give these, I will send this to Joe. I will send both presentations to Joe. Cause I know in that, especially in that last one, we went it was through really so fast. I'm trying to take notes and I'm like failing. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I will send those to Joe and she will be able to email them to everybody. Probably that emails her for them. Happy to do that. Thank you, Heather. Yes. Anybody else? I just won't want to bulldoze forward without pausing and asking if you have any questions, any thoughts. I think it'd be good. I don't, I don't have a mentor and it'd be nice to have one, but like different questions that are good key questions that you might give your students. Like, you know, as you're looking at this, here's some things to ponder as to who you recommendations to how you choose a mentor. Um, like you kind of touched on that a little bit, but if there's more, yeah, write. I think if there's somebody that you that just you have deep admiration or respect for in some type of area of life. So maybe it's in, you know, just how they parent you, you, you recognize that or in how what they've accomplished in the workforce or what you see them doing spiritually that you're like, man, I would love to be where that person is pausing and asking that person, can I have lunch with you and take 60 minutes or 30 minutes? And I'm going to ask you five questions. And so what I always say is don't ask them to be your mentor because sometimes you'll go to that lunch and you're like, oh, this isn't at all what I thought this person was going to be like, or I just don't feel like our personalities connected. Um, but if it goes well and they're, they seem engaged and they're answering those five questions, what you do is you say, Hey, would you mind if I, if we had lunch again next month, could we do this again next month? And you'll be able to tell if that person seems interested. And as that continues, you, what you're doing is you're developing a relationship that can end up being a mentor relationship. I'll say my, um, my mentor right now is Jose Rojas. He's, you know, he's been a speaker in our, the Adventist church for a long time, but I, he changed my life. Honestly, he came and did a week of prayer at Andrews university. Um, back when I was really struggling with some of the aspects of Adventism and he changed how I saw the church and how I saw how I could fit within the church. 
And we talk on the phone every month, typically for like an hour and a half to two hours. And he just kind of tells me everything that he wishes somebody had told him when he had started this journey. So for us, it's more of like a mentorship as far as ministry related, but there's so many things, you know, there's so many other aspects of life that perhaps you might want somebody's advice to journey with you on. And so just think about what areas you're really looking for advice on and who do you think could step into that? Anybody else to have something to add to that about mentorship? And let me say this too. If you don't have a mentor, be one. Guys, we have to stop having conversations saying why I'm very passionate about young adult ministry, but I sit in these meetings and they say, oh, you know, young people are leaving our churches in droves, by the way. I think it's less than, less than 4% of Adventists are under the age of 25. Less than 4%. They are leaving. Our young people, our children are leaving. And I'm telling you, if more adults would say, hey, can I take you to lunch? I would love, I see that you're interested in this and I would love to have a conversation with you. If you don't have a mentor, be one. And it will absolutely impact that young person's journey. I can think of the first time a woman at my um, work, when I first became a professor, it's, like, it's Lynn Caldwell. I don't know if anybody knows her, but such a fantastic just person. And to have somebody who had done everything career-wise that I was trying to do in academia, sit down with me at lunch and say, these are the things that I experienced as a woman. It was life-changing for me. So you, you go through life, how often you think you're the only one with these problems, right? Or experiences. And then to have somebody else say, oh, Heather, I've done that. And here's what I, I heard from God when I went through something similar. It's a really powerful experience. So please, we need women to seek out, I think, especially young women in our churches and just say, can I take you to lunch? Can I have a conversation with you and see what develops? We have like four minutes. So let me ask one question. Anybody who feels like jumping in, please do. When I start to live out of balance, the area of my life that suffers most is usually this. Patience. Tell us more about that. Well, some of you are already aware because I see three of my church friends there. <laughs> I have a husband with Alzheimer's. Okay. And patience. Patience is hard, right? Mm -hmm. Matt, somebody is. I love very much has Alzheimer's right now. So yes, I connect is. to that struggle. And it is, it is a very painful journey to walk through. Um, my prayers with you. And that it's painful for me. Somebody else, when I start to live out of balance, the area of my life that suffers most is usually what? I think for me, the first thing that goes when I'm out of balance is just like my diet and doing anything physical. I, I grew up running track. I had a college scholarship on track. I've been an athlete most of my life. And um, I, I, haven't, I didn't run at all last week. And that's something that for me, running really helps me clear my head. Maybe for you, it's running or walking or hiking or whatever. It's, it, it's almost a spiritual experience for me. I play a sermon or I listen to Christian music and that's my time to just cry out to God about whatever is going on. And that's honestly one of the first things that usually goes for me is I stop paying attention to what I'm eating <laughs> and I stop paying attention to my physical health. Anybody else? When your life is out of balance, what area of your life usually suffers? All right, what about this one? The greatest obstacle to balance in my life is what? What is your greatest obstacle to having balance between all the different hats that you wear in your life? What do you think is the biggest obstacle? I think for me, a lot of times is just learning good time management. Um, I was going to say the same thing, Heidi. <laughs> yeah, it, it's hard sometimes, and you don't realize how much time you're putting into one thing while you're neglecting other. You, know, you think, oh, I'll get to that later, and 
then later comes and you don't have enough time. So for yeah. me, a lot of it's time management. Yeah. I, I relate to that. I can say for myself, something that I've learned um, is that when I'm at work, I'm typically like totally at work. <laughs> and when I'm at home, I am totally at home. Meaning I don't, I don't have my work email connected to my phone intentionally because I have students email me all the time. I don't do that because when I'm at home, I want to be a wife and I want to be a mom. And I'm, my personality is kind of like an all in type person. So anyway, that's just something that I have found is to be, it's very hard to juggle a ton of different things at one time. So I am much more likely to just put everything else down and focus one at a time. And that's why too, I told you, I get up and have um, my time with God, my worship with God at 5 a.m. That's my time to just solely if my kids come down, I tell them, you need to go back to your room. It is not time for you to be up right now. This is my time um, to spend with God and commune with him. So it looks like it's five o'clock. So your guys' is time. So it, I'm assuming that, I don't know if everybody's already back in. Oh, it looks like, yeah, everyone's back in. So I think... Joe, am I, do I, do I pray and send us off? Is somebody else praying? How are we closing out? Nope, oh, she's muted. I can't hear her. If somebody's talking, we can't hear you if you turn your mic on. I'm so used to always talking. I forgot, to talk. <laughs> but um, I don't know if the other facilitators have had the same experience, but in the group that I was involved in, we had some great um, dialogue about what you just shared. And many of them just echoed the importance of learning to remap our brain from that mm -hmm. negative thought, the negative process of that and how it just affects um, all of, of who we are. And, uh, and how uh, many of us just um, have said we want to, you know, set some of these goals that you have challenged us to do and to, um, yeah, just make those changes in our lives because we all want to live a resilient life, right? Like yes. we want to live with that resilient joy so that um, not only for ourselves and for our family, but also that other people, when they see us, they'll say, what does that woman have? Because I want to find out and I want it. Yeah. And we will draw, we will draw others to Christ. So uh, Heather, I would like you to, um, if you wouldn't mind, close us with a word of prayer. Yeah. And, um, and ladies, again, thanks for, for joining. It's so good to see your happy faces out there. Thank you so much, Joe, for inviting me. And thank you, everybody, for allowing me this time with you. What a great two hours it's been, at least for me. So thank you. Let me pray for us as we head out. Dear Heavenly Father, I, I just pray, Lord, for your presence to be with us. You promised to be with us, God. And I pray that we, as, as we're all sitting here in our different homes, in our different situations, in our different experiences, God, May you call us to believe that, that you are with us. And sometimes it won't feel like it, but it doesn't matter what it feels like. We can logically know that you have promised to be with us. And all of scripture boils down to you keeping your promise to one person. You are a promise keeper. So may we leave with that hope and that joy that you are the promise keeper. May you be with us in everything we go through. God, may we open our eyes to recognize your hands in the spaces where we'd rather complain about what isn't working. May we open our eyes to recognize all the ways that you have carried us. And may, as you fill our jars, God, I pray a special anointing over this group of women that we may reach out to our neighbors. That we live a life, God, that is attractive and that other people notice and that you would put us in paths and situations with people that you're trying to reach. May we be held accountable to you 
and work towards what it means to be a real Christian woman, not just at church, but at our jobs and at the gas station, at the grocery store and everywhere in between. May we be Christian women. May we be pillars. Thank you for your protection and providence over us in your name. Amen.